This message is one of those messages where I truly believe that God is going to crack some things open in your heart, in your life, show you some things, because this is what He's been doing in my life and in my heart. And so I'm just on a journey, and I'm sharing my journey with you, and I'm assuming that chances are a lot of you are having that same journey with a different face. So uh, I, I want to share that with you. Also, uh, this message is not one that just came out of the air. It's not one that just came uh, this week. I Actually, it is a part of the messages that I have been preaching over the course of the last three weeks. Uh, when I started the message on communication brings revelation. Communication, uh, 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 not communication, I'm sorry, I'm already messing that up. It was uh, participation brings revelation. And it's in our participation that we have revelation. And then, last week we talked about communication brings expectation or anticipation, right? And so we find that uh, participation brings revelation. When we participate, God reveals certain things to us in amazing ways that we would have never dreamed or understood. It's in being willing to communicate, as we looked in the next message, communicate brings communication brings anticipation and expectation. And we found that there were certain things that Jesus said that set people up with expectation and anticipation of what he was going to do, and he did it. And so it's important that we learn how not only to participate in order that God can reveal certain things to us, but also that we become in that we become active in communicating the faith and the relationship with God that wants that He wants us to communicate and to share the good news of Jesus Christ with others. And in doing that, we create an expectation and an anticipation in the lives of others. Well, this morning, once again, staying on the Tations, I guess. Bad choice of words, I guess, but I'm on tations right now. Expectation, uh, revelation, communication, all right. On the, on the tations moment, I want to talk to you about the simple subject of this. Irritation brings separation. Irritation brings separation. I want to talk to you a little bit about that this morning. Take a look with me in Mark chapter 2. And I'm just going to highlight for a moment, if I may, that Jesus has come come along and he is uh, encountering a, a paralytic person. A person's paralyzed. And what had happened, there were four dudes, and the story here doesn't give you all these details, but we know more of it throughout other portions of Scripture. There's a man who is a paralytic. He's paralyzed. He can't move. He's laying on a bed. And four guys come along and pick him up to take him to Jesus. Well, they get where Jesus is at, and it's so packed with people, they couldn't get to him. Have you ever been in one of those places, whether it's Disneyland or, or Disney World, rather, or maybe you've been to Holiday World and you want to get somewhere and the people are so thick you can't hardly get through. You ever have one of those moments? That's what it was like. And they couldn't get through with this man, so they finally went around, they went up on the roof, they ripped the roof off the house, and they lowered the man down through the roof to the feet of Jesus. Now that was pretty clever because... I don't know about you, but I've tried to measure certain things out, and sometimes my measurements don't always land things right where I want them to be. But it's pretty amazing that they were able to know exactly where Jesus was, tear the roof apart, and lower him right to the feet of Jesus. But that's what happens here in this story. And we find, beginning in verse number 4, it says, And when they, had come, or, and when they could not uh, get near to him because of the crowd. They removed the roof above him, and when they had made the opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lie or lay. Verse five. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, "Son, your sins are forgiven." Now, here's the verse I want you to take note of, because my story is not so much about the healing of the man. It's not so much about the paralytic, but it's about those that are observing and watching. Look at verse 6. It says, Now some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their heart. Now, what is the picture here? What does it mean they're questioning in their heart? They were doubting. They were chewing on what they were seeing. They were allowing their... They had self-talk going on, didn't they? You know, my dad always said, be careful what you say to yourself. 
There's one person sometimes you need to be more cautious to listen to, and that's yourself. Because a lot of times you will self-destruct when you listen to yourself. And I tell people, you got to be careful. You're, you overthink things. You overanalyze things. And, and I am notorious for overanalyzing things. And I have to watch out for that because it affects my spirit if I'm not careful. It will destroy me from the inside out. And so I want to encourage you. And we find here that these scribes are sitting around. They're having all this self-talk going on. And look at verse number, um, verse number 7. Jesus, uh, it says... Um, what they were questioning in their heart is verse 7, why does this man speak like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Now hold on a minute. Let me, let me bring this home. Let me park this in your garage, okay? Here's what Jesus is saying. These guys are sitting around going, why does he chew his food like that? Why does he pop his knuckles all the time? Why is she always sucking wind so loud? All right, that's not exactly what he's saying, but what I'm getting at here is that the scribes are sitting around thinking in their heart they are getting irritated with things that Jesus is doing. And who is Jesus? He's the Son of God, right? He's perfect. He's without fault. He's without failure. He's without sin. And yet, as perfect as he is, he's irritating the life out of other people around him. It says in verse number 6, Now some of the scribes were sitting there, questioning in their heart. Why? Verse 7. Why does this man speak like that? Why does he snort? Why does he... It doesn't say all those little irritating things, but I'm just trying to bring us home to where you're at. We become like these scribes when we allow ourselves to let other things irritate us because irritation brings separation. And in their heart, they separated themselves from Jesus because Jesus irritated them. And they said in their heart, they were saying, why does he speak like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Now get this, verse number 8. And immediately Jesus, perceiving in his spirit that they were thus questioned, that they thus questioned within themselves, said to them, Why do you question these things in your heart? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Rise and take up your bed and walk? but that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. Then what happens here? He turns to the paralytic. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. Verse 12, and he rose and immediately picked up his bed and went out before them all, that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, we never saw things like this. That's a big statement. This is an amazing story, what's happened here. And, and let me help you understand, the ones that are missing the whole point of what's going on are the ones that are allowing themselves to be in this place of, of being irritated by Jesus, that being the religious leader. So what I want to do is I want to talk to you for a few moments about irritation, what irritation is about. And I want to first of all say that the definition of irritation is simply this. It is a state of feeling annoyed, impatient, or angry. That's irritation. I know that there's probably not a single person in this room that's ever experienced irritation. Right? No. None of us need this this morning. But I'm going to give it to you so you can talk to the friends that you have. You know, the other people that need to hear this. So you can give it to them, okay? I'm going to give this to you so you can help them on this area of irritation. Now, to give you a physical example of what irritation is, so my wife was driving down the road one day, and she saw a sledgehammer that was laying on the side of the road that somebody had, you know, that was free. They are giving it away, and the reason is because the handle on the, the thing was broken stuff, and Betty thought, you know, John might be able to use a, 
a sledgehammer. It didn't look fully broke when it was sitting on the side of the road there. She went and picked it up, put it in the car. We're not too proud to say that there's something there and somebody's giving it away. So be it, right? Brought it home. I used sledgehammer. We used it yesterday to bust up the sink down the basement to get that concrete sink out of the basement. So this sledgehammer, she brought it home. It needed to be repaired. So I took the handle and I put some wood glue in it and I and I put it together, and I slid. I was sliding some, some clamps down on it to tighten it up, and in the middle of sliding it down, a splinter went poosh, right in under my skin and, my, and deep, and my skin was irritated. Irritation is when we allow things to get under our skin, when we allow things to affect us, to change the way we're thinking in the moment. And that's what happened in that moment. Now, I got it together, taped it up and everything. And like I said, we used it yesterday and it was awesome. But boy, I still have a scar on my finger right here where that splinter went into my finger. And it was so bad I had to go to the clinic, which thank God for EBSC free clinic for those who drive buses. I went to the free clinic. They looked at it, gave me some medicine for it. And I took some medicine and got most of, I got most of the splinter out. There may still be a little piece in there, but I still have a scar from that. And it hurt. I'm going to tell you, it hurt. Now, I, want to, I also want you to understand, when things irritate us, the same things can happen to us inside. They can hurt very deeply. I don't belittle the fact that irritation can create, create a lot of dis, distress inside of us, a lot of hurt, a lot of pain. And sometimes it can even leave scars. Irritation can. And the effects of it. What is the cause of irritation? In the case of the sledgehammer, it was the splinter that went in my finger. But when it comes to us as a person, what creates irritation? And I do believe that a lot of times we will tend to believe that irritation comes because of other people's faults. Because other people fail to do what they ought to do. So when we look at it as though it's other people's faults, we look at it like it's a lack of common sense. You ever been irritated with somebody because they just weren't practicing common sense? Oh, that'll irritate somebody, right? It's like, really? Anybody in their right mind would know you don't do that. You do this. We can all be irritated by a lot of different things, but common sense can oftentimes be a reason for irritation, a lack of respect can be a cause for irritation, a lack of manners, somebody not acting right, approaching things properly, a lack of decency or standards can be irritating, a lack of priorities, maybe some of you are a real priority in it, uh, you know, driven and you got priorities and people that don't have priorities, it just irritates you to death. Right? There's a lot of things that can create irritation inside of us. But I want you to know as we look at this subject, uh, I, I can't help but think that another example of irritation can be rubbing a cat's fur backwards. <laughs> you know, the old saying is, boy, that's like rubbing a fur of the cat backwards, right? Sometimes a cat will turn around, right? Swing at you. If they don't like you rubbing their hair backwards, a dog, maybe not so much, but a cat, they're finicky. You never know what's going to come out of a cat, right? Cats are from the devil. But now, oh, did I say that? <laughs> okay. That's, just kidding. I love cats as long as they're yours, all right? Now, Here's the thing. I'm just kidding. If you love cats, I don't want you to take that offensive. I just want you to keep your cat, all right? And take care of your cat. And, and don't, don't believe anything anybody would say about me and cats, all right? Because they, may, not tell, they may, may be twisting things. All right. So here's the thing. Because I like cats, sort of. All right. We need to get off the subject of cats, all right? Now, here's the thing. Is when we... Oftentimes, what happens with irritation is that other people respond differently on things than we would respond, right? Now, hear me out for a minute. So, when somebody's not responding or acting the same way that we would respond or act, a lot of times, that can create irritation. 
But boy, my wife has called me out on this over the course of our marriage where there would be times somebody would do something. I'm like, man, what were they thinking? Why didn't they do this or do that? And, you know, and she's like, well, wait a minute. You know, just because you know how to do that doesn't mean they know how to do that. And then God pressed it on my heart to help me realize that what creates irritation on that level is when we, and I'm, I'm making admittance, and I'm probably going to swipe across quite a few of you in this auditorium right now because if we've dealt with this, this is where it comes from. When we set ourselves up as the standard of how it should be done, that's called pride. And so we get irritated with others when others don't do it the way we think it should be done or how we would have done it. And then we set ourselves up as the standard of measurement and we measure other people up according to ourselves. And the Bible says that that's thinking of ourselves more highly than we ought to think. But the Bible says to think on the things of others rather than on the things of ourselves. So we ought to be careful not to set ourselves up as the point of measurement. When we do, that puts us in a bad place. When we measure others after ourselves, that's pride. Let me take you to a verse in Proverbs chapter 13, verse 10. You can write that down. I'm going to quote it to you. I'm going to quote the first part of the verse to you. But I would encourage you to write it down because it is a life-changing verse. All right? It is one of those nuggets, a gold nugget, that I have... Found and I in my life God has showed it to me and I've put it in my pocket and it is a reminder to me all the time Don't fail to pick up this nugget because it'll be important to you as well But the scripture says in Proverbs chapter 13 and verse 10 only Only what does only mean? It means no other way it seems it means single right there's there's no other way only, get this now, listen, it says, only by pride comes contention. And contention has to do with irritation, impatience, all these things. Only by pride comes contention. Contention is when there's a problem between two people. There's a contentious moment. Irritation, frustration comes when we are using ourself as a measurement and we measure other people according to ourself. That's pride. And when we live in pride, we are then going to have contention with other people. Does that make sense? So we have to guard our heart from that. One other thing I want to bring out to you, though, is irritation is not just something we have with other people. Hear me out. If you miss this part, you're going to miss the foundation of everything I'm saying to you today. Irritation is not when we just have issues with other people. Irritation can oftentimes and most of the time begins with how things happen around us. Like, for instance, you get a flat tire, you get irritated, you get upset, right? Has nothing to do with anybody else, has to do with yourself. Matter of fact, there are certain things that can happen and, and, and if we're not careful, that irritation, it doesn't center around other people. It has to do with irritations of the things that happen around us. Traffic, for instance. There's no person you're angry with. You're just frustrated with the traffic in general. You're irritable. You're irritated. You can get irritated with yourself. You know, like, I cannot believe I've lost my keys for the fifth time today. Right? You get irritated with you. You're not irritated with anybody per se. You're just irritated. All of us deal with this, don't we? If you don't, you live on another planet. <laughs> all right? But I think if you're sucking the same oxygen I'm sucking, I believe we all deal with these areas, don't we? And so irritation can happen, and it's things that happen around us. We can be irritated with our vehicle. We can be irritated with the weather. We can be irritated by the events of life. Yesterday started out really nice, tongue-in-cheek. I got irritated from the moment my day started. 
Got up, got to the church, neighbor comes over, says, hey, the water department shut the water off and blah, 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 and you heard the story. And so now we're working on trying to find and chase down this leak. And in the midst of trying to chase down the leak, we thought maybe the water here wasn't that. And so then we're shutting off the house water, thinking we'll find out. Maybe if with the city water, we turned it back on, we turned off the, the intake of the water at the at where it comes into the house stuff, we turn that off, we'll find out, isolate it, and maybe it's leaking outside the house. And we thought, and so we're twisting the knob, getting it shut off real tight, but it's well, just as soon as you start turning it off, the faucet starts kind of dripping and leaking. You know how that goes until you get it seated well. So we're, you know, we tighten it up, and it's not, it doesn't quit running. Like, and it's not just drip, drip, it's like, like a slow drain and it's like so we put a bucket under it we're trying to shut it off and we're really torquing and it's saying you know and the knob pops off and the stem breaks whole day was nothing but now I've, i'm working on a project we weren't even supposed to be working on and i'm spending a day working on this project so what happens bailey and i get in a car and we shoot off the lows to buy the parts that we need and we're on our way back i call uh, uh papa john's and uh, order some pizzas so that people around here could get something to eat. And so we stop at uh, Walmart, run into Walmart. I get some two liters, got them in my hand, go up to the cashier. Bailey picked up a couple things. We go to the cashier and I'm paying for it. And then I put things back, put my wallet in my pocket, grab the bottles. I say, uh, Bailey, I'm going to run to the car and get it. I'm going to pull up, pick you up so we can keep moving. Because we got people at church, we can't let any grass grow on our feet. You know me. Right? So I uh, literally jogging out to the car, open the door, throw the bag in. I get in the car, still got the receipt in my hand. I start backing up. Bailey's there, gets in. We start pulling out of the parking lot over here at Marketplace, get to the end of the, of, the, of the parking lot, get ready to turn. I'm thinking, I got the receipt. I need to put it in my wallet, reach back, and my wallet's gone. And I got short of $600 in my wallet which is very unusual for me to ever carry cash like that in my pocket, but I did. And my heart drops. I said, oh, Bailey, my wallet's gone. We do a UE. We go back in. We go where my parking spot was. Somebody had already parked there. I jump out of the car. I hit the asphalt. I'm looking under the car. I trace my steps. He's going to the service desk to see if anybody turned it in. We go in. Nothing. It's gone. But in the search for this, I'm in a panic, you know, and the cart lady's out there, and she's doing her thing, and she sees me going through, you know, looking, and, and finally she's like, is there something I can help you with? I said, yeah, I've lost my wallet. If you happen to see it, if you'd hang on to it, I'd appreciate it. And she said, yeah, I'll watch for it. And so, long story short, I've talked to some management and all, got in the car, drove back to church, trying to shake this off. By the way, one of the first thoughts in my mind when I lost my wallet was, how in the world am I going to pay for this pizza now? Right? Wasn't even thinking about 600 bucks first. I think about hungry people at church waiting to eat, and I'm starving myself. I, mean, I can't even pay for the pizza I just ordered. And then I thought about $600, and then I thought about, oh my, what's my wife going to say about me losing 600 bucks, right? So I get on the phone, and I'm talking to my wife, and I had her on speakerphone. Bailey can contest to this conversation. She's like, you know, I realize that's not what you want to happen. Nobody should steal or thieve anything. But at the end of the day, maybe that person needed the money worse than you did. And I looked at Bailey. Remember, I said, here comes the sermon, right? I said, here comes the message. It's coming. Somebody got to preach the preacher. Thank God my wife, she preaches <laughs> to you, preacher. And she's sharing with me, having the right attitude. I'm like, you're right. That's true. So come back to the church, get here. and We're going through, you know, we get everything finished up. I finally get a knob put on the thing in the basement so we can shut off any little drizzle of water that keeps coming in. And so, after all that, get in the car and I start back down to Walmart. I think I'm going to go check, see if anybody turned anything in on my way. I happened to set my phone up on the magnetized thing and, my, and the little screen popped up and somebody had said, uh, requested um, to connect with me on Messenger. I thought, who's that? And so opened it up and it said, the cart lady found your wallet. Just, you know, like emotion just like one drain out of me, right? 
So I, I said, I'm on my way. Thank you so, so much. And so I drove there, got there. The cart lady, she came out. And she said to me, she didn't say anything. At first I said, I understand you, you found my wallet. She said, yes. And we hugged and just embraced for a moment. And then she pulled back and she said, you're a man of God, aren't you? Amen. I said, do what? She said, you're a man of God, aren't you? I said, yes, ma'am, I am. She said, I knew it. When I was out in the parking lot and just the moment you turned around to say something to me, I could feel it on you that you were a man of God. She said, as soon as you left, I started telling everybody to look for this man's wallet. We need to find it. Well, in the process, we walked over and she grabbed her little vest she had sitting over in a pile and she pulled the wallet out. She said, I can't contest for what's in here or not in here. This is what was given to me. And she said, somebody said it was left in a cart. I never had a cart. So I got a lot of assumptions how it ended up in a cart. Probably somebody took the money, threw it in a cart, let somebody else turn it in. I opened it up, and the money was gone. Everything else was there, which I was very thankful for. Of course, all the, any of the cards were already shut down, my debit card and everything. We called and got all that done. But the money was gone. And, but I was thankful to have my wallet back. I stuck it in my pocket. As I was pulling out of Walmart, first thing I did, I started praying. I said, Lord, I said, let that money turn bitter in the hand of whoever has it. I pray that it become a curse to them. Wasn't right of them to take it. And then God convicted me. Not your place. I said, God, I'm sorry. Sorry. Shouldn't be my attitude. I said, God, you know what? Multiply that. Take that and just multiply. Let me just remind you, and God reminded me of this yesterday. Everything I have is a seed that God's given to me. And that seed is meant for me to do something with it and to plant it and do something with it. But if I have a seed and somebody comes along and steals my seed, why should I get all upset that I still shouldn't want God to multiply that seed? Regardless if I intentionally did something with it or if something unintentionally happens to it or with it. We have to leave things alone. I don't know about you, six, $600 is a lot of money. $200 a lot, $50 a lot of money. $25 is a lot of money. I don't care what Nancy Pelosi says. It's a lot of money. I don't care who they are. I don't care how little it is. It's a lot of money. I don't want to lose it. I didn't want to let go of that. But at the end of the day, I had to do a heart check. And here's what I want you to understand. It's not about what happens to you in life. It's how you handle what happens to you in life. And all of us can make the decision one way or the other. And I started down the wrong road. I really did. My flesh was getting in the way. And then God's Spirit convicted me and helped me understand that was wrong of me. And I needed to make it right. So I had to let go of that. Did I want to lose 600 bucks? Absolutely not in a million years. Have I beat myself up over that? A hundred times over. What could I have done different? What should I have done? You know, the, I shouldn't have had the money on me in the first place. But I was going to the bank. that I, I was going to try to get to the bank before the bank closed to deposit the money. And I can go through all the scenarios, and I did. But then I had to let go of it. And I said, God, I'm putting this in your hands. You do with it what you need to do with it. You multiply it however you choose to multiply it. Now, the greatest multiplication in my books would be if God would let that money be a reminder to somebody that their choices in life is self-satisfying and, and trying to provide for themselves, and that maybe somewhere down the line God will bring that back to their memory and remind them of that in a way that they will realize under whatever being under the preaching of the Word or whatever, they'll come to realize that Jesus is the only one that will satisfy their soul I don't know what the lesson will be one day but my prayer is that God will multiply that and do some amazing things with that so when it comes to irritation it's not always about people it starts in the heart the Bible says from the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks understand this Jesus perceived 
in their heart before it ever came out of their mouth. What was in their heart, they were pondering and thinking over it. And I'm sure somewhere down the line, had Jesus not addressed it, they would have soon spoke it out of their mouth. I think sometimes we think it's all about what we said or didn't say or how we did this or didn't do that. At the end of the day, our actions, our words are nothing more than a display of our heart. And our heart's what needs to change. The, cri- the scribes were here saying in their heart these things and Jesus addressed them. So as you go to the doctor and you see you have a, a deficiency, a real lack somewhere, maybe deficiency in vitamin, he'll prescribe that you take X amount of vitamins a day to build up that deficiency of vitamins or whatever it might be. May I say this? I just want to address with you the real lack or deficiency we have that creates that irritation in our life. So everything I've said at this point, if I left it off right there, it would be a pretty negative message, right? Just kind of, woe is us. (laughs) Because I spoke about the the humanity of you and me. I mean, this is our life's journey. But there's an answer to it. And I don't want you to miss that answer. Let's look at it. Take your Bibles and turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And here in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, we're going to look at just a few verses here. And uh, I'm not going to read the whole passage. But if you want to understand what love is, you have to get to know this passage. Because this is God's definition of love. Look with me, if you would. I'm going to start in verse number 4 and following. It says, love is patient and what? And kind. So, I had to practice patience yesterday by saying, you know what, God, I'm giving this to you. I drove back to church, did the work day, finished things up here. I had to be patient to get back in my car, to get back over there. And in my patience, though, of that whole journey... God reminded me it's not about praying for curses and bitterness on other people, but to express kindness to them. And so I pray God multiply whatever it is and do something with it. I want what's best for that person. I want God to do something with that in their life. It's, it's loving somebody. It's more than just being patient and enduring and long-suffering, but it's also reaching out with kindness. And it says, love does not envy or boast. In other words, it doesn't look at other people's stuff and go, well, it's not fair. They got this or they got that. Or it doesn't puff itself up and make itself the measurement that, they, that you measure everything else to. You don't measure other people to yourself, your choices, your common sense, your wisdom. We can't do that. Real love doesn't do that. It is not arrogant. It's not rude. It says it does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Verse number 7. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. And I don't want you to miss that. It's not a matter that love, well, it applies to certain situations, certain ways, certain times. It is applied to all things. There's nothing it's not applied to. We can't excuse ourselves. We have to look at ourselves. We have to do a self-examination. We have to allow God's Word to reveal to our heart the things that we have deficiency in, and we need to see it fixed. Now, the tendency would be here this morning as we wrap this thing up, is you might look at me and say, Pastor, so what you're saying I miss is I miss love. Well, it may appear that be the case, but it's more than that you need love. You need more of Jesus. That means you need more of a relationship, a walk with Jesus every day. That's what I'm referring to. 
Because the Bible says, he that knows God knows love, for God is love. If I have a need for something, I don't run after that need. I run after the one who provides the need. If I, am, if I, if I need money, I don't run after money. I go to the one who holds the possession of money. I go to the banker. I go to, when I was a kid, I went to mom and dad, <laughs> you know. I remember my dad said to me one day, he said, son, you need to go out and get you a job. I said, dad, I'm on child welfare right now. <laughs> and he laughed too. He thought that was rather funny. I was serious. <laughs> Here's the thing, is that too often we run after what we have need of rather than running after the one who can provide our need who can meet our need. Hear me out, please. Satan will always have you to run after what you feel like you need and totally cause you to miss what you truly have need of. When I have a relationship with Jesus, it changes my perspective of other people. It changes my perspective of life. It changes the way I approach things. But then it also helps me to look in the dark, deep recesses of my own life and my own thoughts and my own struggles that I have to call myself out, to call out the thing in my life that shouldn't be there, even when nobody else sees it. That's how our life is changed, by the encounter with Jesus. So the lack that's needed is agape love. Now hear me out for a moment. Agape love is a godly love. It's a love that only a person who knows Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior, who has committed their life to Jesus, received the forgiveness of his sins through what Jesus did on the cross of Calvary for them, and their sins have been paid for in full by Jesus. Only that person can truly understand and encounter agape love and express agape love to others. If you're not saved, you can't. You can express love on a lot of levels, but you cannot express it on that level. It's impossible. That's what marks the difference between a true follower of Jesus and a religious person. A religious person will tolerate you and put up with you and do certain things, but at the end of the day, it is really based on another person. So what is agape love? I believe it's summed up pretty much in this one verse. I don't know if you can put this verse up. I don't know if you know how to do that or not. But Isaiah 43, verse 25. Isaiah 43, verse 25. If you have your Bibles, you can turn there and look at it. But I want to share this one verse. I believe it's all summed up in this one verse, what agape love looks like. This is powerful. This is amazing. You ready? Oh, it's already there. Here we go. Look at it. It just simply says, I, I am he who blots out your transgressions. Look at the next few words. For my own sake. And I will not remember your sins. Why, does God, why is God willing to blot out our sin and forgive us of our sin? Because we deserve it. Because we're going to make better choices in life. And so God's going to be glad with me. No. He does it based on himself. He does it for his own self. You know why I need to have victory over being irritable and, 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 and being contentious with other people? Because at the end of the day, I need to guard my own heart for my own sake. I don't need to allow myself to go there because it will destroy me. It will turn me ugly. That victory is only found when I realize it's not that I am not going to be irrit irritated by people based on, well, if they quit being ir irritating, I won't be irritated no more. If I rely on other people, then there's a problem. God doesn't rely on us to forgive us. He relies on himself. He blots out our sins based on his own self, not based on us. Why should we forgive someone else? Because they deserve to be forgiven? No. No, because God forgave us when we didn't deserve it, and we ought to forgive others even when they don't deserve it. It's not based on us. It's not based on them. It's based on Jesus Christ. It's based on a relationship with Him. I don't want you to miss this this morning. 
There is a need, I believe, that each and every one of us have. And the scripture says that Christ, even as he was able and and he was willing and he gave his forgiveness and he blotted out our transgression, our sin, our wrong, he did that based on himself and not on us. And he's not even going to remember it anymore. So here's what happened. You can say, well, pastor, I've tried and I keep failing that. I get it. Yesterday, I gave it to the Lord. I said, God... I give this to you. I'm not going to worry about that money anymore. I'm not going to worry about this anymore. I give it to you. You do with it what you need to do with it. I'm not going to let it affect me anymore. And an hour later, what am I doing? I'm telling somebody else's story. and I'm telling them how I think it probably went down. My wife looks at me and says, I thought you let go of that. Yeah, I thought I did too. (laughs) Can I say this? Letting go of something, and I loved what she said to me. She said, you know what? She says, it's not a matter that you let go of it and it's gone. It's that it is a process of letting go of it. Our walk with the Lord is not something that just happens and now we got it. It is a process. And just because you may not get it right every time doesn't mean you're a failure. Doesn't mean you'll never find victory. The Bible says that we are not to grow weary in well-doing because He promises we will reap if we faint not. We will reap if we faint not. If I don't give up, God says I'm going to have victory. That's His promise. You're only a loser when you quit. You're only one who fails to win when you quit. Every head bowed and every eye closed this morning.